Okay, good evening, everyone. It is 704 Mountain, 904 Eastern. That's about all I am good for with time zones. I'm lucky I got those right. And I am so pleased to see so many people here. I think this is the most we've, we've had at a town hall. And the way this generally works, um, hopefully you did get a chance to take a look at the document that was prepared. There was a update to it um, earlier today with some proposals that were passed since the announcement originally went out. Uh, it's the same link. So if you had a link to it or you were looking at it on LPD, if you just re refresh that link, it will reflect the most current version. And the way this is works is I'll put up the the proposals, uh, the, the report actually, and then the meeting is pretty much controlled by the members. Whatever um, the members would like to talk about, any particular proposals. Um, there are some caveats here. While certainly if there's something that you feel is of urgent importance that the committee did not address, feel free and comment to suggest it. But fair warning, um, the likelihood of us passing any additional proposals is pretty slim, very, very slim. We already have to cut down on the ones we have. All the ones that are in that report, are there is not going to be time to be heard. So we are kind of in a culling phase, but we don't discount the possibility that a member could see something that is like absolutely critical and can convince one of the bylaws committee members to bring it forward. I just don't want to get anyone's hopes up. I think this is our fourth town hall. You know, the, the time for new proposals was more towards the beginning. But one thing I would like to do before we get started, since we do have so many party members here, and this will be up um, on YouTube after, after the meeting, is the committee members that are here, uh, if you could introduce yourself so that the members here know who the committee members are. And what I'll do is I'll I'll just try to call on you from my list so we're not talking over one another. So I am the bylaws and rules committee chair. So Ms. Arrowwood. Yes, I'm Sylvia Arrowwood from South Carolina. I'm the secretary of our committee. Um, Mr. Rogers. Hi, I'm Dean Rogers. I am uh, an alternate. I'm the seventh, the last alternate, and I'm from Virginia. Um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Moulton? Uh, Chuck Moulton. Uh, I am now residing in Tennessee, originally from Pennsylvania, bounced around a bunch. Um, I've been on this bylaws. I've served on the bylaws committee many terms. Uh, I started off as an alternate this term, but was moved to a full member when another member resigned. Hey, Mr. Martin. Hi, everybody. Frank Martin uh, out here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Glad you're here. And Mr. Seebeck? Uh, yes, Mike Seebeck, um, appointed by the LNC. I'm out of Alabama. This is my third or fourth uh, bylaws committee. Uh, Mr. Sazelski? Uh, Nick Sazelski, uh, Pennsylvania, formerly of uh, Georgia. I didn't know you were in Pennsylvania. I still thought you were in Georgia. I don't know why I thought that. Um, no, I moved last fall. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Mr. Bracco? Paul Bracco, uh, Virginia, far too close to D.C. <laughs> and uh, I am the committee's official troublemaker. Are you north of Richmond, though? Yes. Are you I a rich told man? that I would be get getting paid, but uh, <laughs> yeah. not yet. <laughs> Mr. Latham. And and here I thought I was the committee's official troublemaker. So that's great that Mr. Bracco uh, claims that title. Rob Latham from Utah. I also serve on the Judicial Committee and have served on both this committee and that committee on prior terms. I'm actually going to call upon our official troublemaker, though. So I'm, I'm stealing the title away from both of you guys. Mr. Roulette. Hi, I'm from Missouri. I'm the troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss any committee members? Because I was just trying to go down the list quickly. 
If I did, uh, yell out. Yeah, I don't see anyone. Um, Wait a minute, you mean I'm not the, I'm not the troublemaker this time? You are not the troublemaker this time. Okay, I'm going I'm losing to my touch. I'm going to share my screen, and what I would ask, I'm trying to do this in the most organized way possible. You're um, a party member, and you you have a question. Uh, just raise your hand by hitting the reactions button, and with the questions, um, I'll attempt to answer. And other committee members that might wish to answer, um, maybe indicate in chat or raise your hand. It's it, This is going to be pretty informal, doing the hand raising thing more so that we're not talking over each other, not so much for the formalities. Um, and if we, and I do see your hand, Mr. Comrade, thank you, I'll call upon you in one moment. And if there ever becomes a lull where there are no hands raised, We'll just start going through proposals um, with some explanations from where we left off at last town hall. But the entire, I don't want to call it a report, but it is kind of a report. The preliminary report is open for discussion, not just things that are new since last town hall. So let me get my screen shared and then I will call upon you, Mr. Conrad. Just one moment. Okay, I think... All right, Mr. Conrad. Good evening. Um, is there a link we can drop in the chat to the most recent version of the document? Yes, let me do that. Thank you. Though I will, um, this is gonna be a, a, a Google link. If for some reason it looks wonky, I'll drop in the Elpedia one. Google has had a, a caching problem where it's sometimes isn't showing the latest document. I was going through this with Mr. McMahon of Indiana. So hopefully this will work fine. Otherwise we can stick up the Elpedia version because Elpedia seems to be updating faster than, than Google has been lately. All right, anyone, if again, you have questions, please raise your hand. And if anyone on the committee, do you remember where we left off at the last town hall. Oh boy. I think it was, I really don't know, somewhere around K or L. It really doesn't matter where we start because again, it's all open for discussion, but I'm probably just gonna pick something at random, which might be a little duplicative. Um, Mr. Duracci. Hello. Uh, I was wondering if before we got into the current proposals, if I could ask the committee to consider a new one. I know you said you're past that phase, but I have one that I think is important for the committee to either take up or discard. Um, certainly. And I'll give you my honest opinion as to the likelihood of whether someone will consider it, but it's obviously up to the committee. But go ahead, sir. Well, I'd like to request a proposal that changes the uh, date of the national convention. And that actually, if I could pass it to Colsty, I think he can explain this better than I can. And so I'll yield to him on this, because like I said, I think he can explain it a little bit better. Uh, Mr. Colsty? Uh, yes, basically uh, having the national convention after the petitioning period is not not really helpful, in the, especially in the state of New York where our ballot access requirements are much higher and the only way this would change would basically have to be at the 2024 national convention uh because by the time of the 2026 i'm assuming the 28 convention would be scheduled and it'd be ideal for the 2028 prior to 2028 for any state's petitioning period for the national convention to occur before that so we know who the national nominee is we can petition for the nominee instead of a stand-in that isn't going to really get any attention or um, any any good chance of getting on the ballot. So um, if the committee would consider that, I could help with language. Um, I think it'd be very important, especially for states that petition before we even know who our nominee is. That's all. Thank you. Um, 
I want to bring something to your attention. The bylaws do not set the date of the convention. So um, this is a request that probably more properly would go to the LNC that is setting the date for the 2028 convention. Um, our bylaws say that our convention, we can find if someone would like to look that up. I, I think it's anywhere it's, from the uh, August of the prior year. Article uh, 10.1. Go ahead, Mr. Greco. What does it say? Regular, regular conventions shall be held sometime during the period of July of an odd-numbered year through August of an even-numbered year. Yes, yeah, so there's a 13-month period in which we can have ours. The LNC sets the date of the conventions. Um, however, I can tell you, um, while it, it's a balancing act, while it might be more advantageous for some states, for the majority of states, having an earlier convention uh, messes them up really badly, um, particularly states that do already have ballot access. And what ends up happening, though the LNC can do what it wishes. Um, I can tell you, I personally um, spoke against this on the LNC when we were setting the 2026 convention. We all think about our home states, quite obviously, but most states would then have their delegates either selected a year in advance, and we all know that people don't know what they're gonna be doing a year in advance, or their state committees end up making their delegate selection, which I know <coughs> some states do that already, but most don't. They're elected at a convention relatively close to the national convention. And uh, my feeling is this would end up putting delegate selection primarily in the hands of state boards rather than delegates, or cause states like Colorado to have to have two conventions. So it's a balancing act. I know Angela is very sympathetic to having it earlier. So she's who you need to talk to, but it's not a bylaws thing. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Madden. Uh, yes, I just, I also wanted to reiterate that uh, the bylaws only give the range if you were going to do something with the bylaws, then all you would be able to do is uh, either narrow or extend the range. Uh, I do believe that this idea has some merit. Uh, I think that probably the fall season before, or the, the fall season the year prior, uh, probably Labor Day would probably be best, just for the simple fact that uh, this preempts anything with any state law uh, saying, oh, well, you need to do X, like we saw, I believe, in, uh, uh, not New, what's the one next to New Hampshire they have a rival with? Massachusetts. Um, so the Massachusetts state chair uh, put forward their, the candidate names for the presidential preference election and intentionally withheld names. Uh, Obviously, it's not binding to the LNC or the convention body, but certain things like that would uh, definitely be preempted if we did th this sort of thing. Uh, and then we also know going into the election year exactly who's running, who we're supporting, uh, how we're supporting, and what we what we're really we have more time to just do a game plan at, and so does the candidate themselves. So I think that this gives us more time. It's something that that we can get more energy into. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Hi, you're welcome. And again, this will be an argument to make to the LNC. I would encourage everyone. I'm not saying this. Uh, it, it happens to be on my YouTube channel. Um, but if you uh, respect Mr. Dasbach, who's been a prior several time chair, multiple campaign manager. Um, he is opposed to the idea of having it terribly earlier, gives very cogent reasons why with over two decades of party experience and the fact that we used to do it the year before. Um, so I can't do it right now, but if any, if you go to my YouTube channel, which is Pink Flame of Liberty, um, search for Steve Dasbach and you can see the interview I did with Mr. Dasbach on this. He is a fan of potentially having it in February-ish um, on an even number year, but says 
there's very few people who have experience with presidential being on the, the, the top level team of a national presidential ticket who would be in favor of having it the year before. And he gives a lot of reasons. You obviously do not have to agree with him, but that's another perspective. But I can tell you at least this particular LNC, if they were to have a vote probably on a date for 2028, I would be outvoted. I think most people would, would do it earlier. Um, however, uh, th there is a word of caution. I always like to, to tell people, um, whenever you're, you're talking about changing something, ask if we used to do it the way you're asking us to do it now. And if we did, ask why we're not doing that anymore. Because perhaps the reasons we're not aren't valid anymore. But what I find on bylaws, particularly, even though this turns out not to be a bylaws issue, is we ping pong. Let's do it this way. And then we find out it doesn't work. And we go back. And then 10 years later, everyone's forgotten that we used to do it a certain way. And it didn't work. And they're talking about doing it the other way again. So the party used to do odd year conventions. And we don't. Um, I would highly encourage anyone who is proposing even year conventions to research why we stopped. And be able to cogently explain why that reason is no longer valid or why it wasn't a valid reason then. Otherwise we're ping ponging back every decade and redoing things we've already tried and for some reason stopped. I don't know all the reasons we stopped to be honest with you. I believe it was due to changing ballot access laws in the majority of states. But someone who's been around the party longer um, would probably know the answer to that better than I would. Um, I see Mr. C back, I don't know if we're still on this one. I'd like to get to something that the bylaws committee can really do, which isn't this. Um, and then there's Mr. Conrad again, but Mr. C back. Um, yes, could we ha um, have people who are not speaking mute? I'm getting a lot of background noise um, besides the speak person speaking. Yes, if, you, if you're not Thank speaking, you. if you could, if you could please mute. Um, Mr. Jacobs asked me if I could let Jessica in. She must be using the wrong link because I do not have anyone in the waiting room. There is a different link for the town hall than for the regular bylaws committee meeting. I realize I stopped my share. Um, I do see that Ms. Tewksbury just registered. I am going to approve her registration. Um, Mr. Conrad, if you would like to speak. Uh, I apologize. I did not know that there were several other town halls prior to this one. Um, so I'm going back to proposal I, which yeah. has substantially the same language in the rationale as proposal J, even though the proposals are substantively very different. So I think this is an oversight. It could be. Let me look. When you're doing this sort of thing, it gets really crazy. So let me look. You, I believe, are, let me see here. It does. I will fix that. Did you have, um, a, I'm sorry, did you have a question on I? But thank you for, I'm going to make a note <laughs> of that. Uh, yeah, I would like to know the rationale behind I. Um, the, so there are two proposals that very heftily cut the ability of the body to delete um, platform planks. Um, and I uh, don't think, I think there should be different standards for adding a plank and deleting a plank. Because when we add a plank, we want to be very careful that the language reflects the broad range of all the libertarians we have in our movement from minarchists to agorists to anarchists, pro-life, pro-choice, pro-border, pro-immigration. Uh, but if we have 65.9% of libertarians who feel that a plank is not representative of their views, like that's a very high threshold to say, Ah, too bad you 65.9% of people like you need two thirds. Like I think if it takes two thirds to add a plank, it should only take one third to delete a plank. But certainly if the majority of the body feels like a plank is not representative of our views, we should be able to drop it and not have to have that in our um, platform. So 
that, and so that's why I was looking at that proposal and proposal I, and I wanted to see more of the rationale there because I don't agree with the motion. One moment. Um, I'm going to need to stop my share uh, unless somebody else from the bylaws committee can pull up the rationale for proposal I, because I can't get into the drive right now. Um, Mr. Bracco. So uh, I just want to clarify, it, it's given the content of, I believe, proposal E was the one where we were, which is uh, making platform deletion two thirds. Um, proposal I is is a different kind of thing. So just to, to clarify, proposal I isn't actually changing the threshold for um for deleting a plank it's changing it the, the allocation thresh. correct it changes the threshold but, at which we can vote on deleting a plank with the either one half or two-thirds threshold and it reduces the number of tokens available to meet that threshold so it is actually quite limiting on the body's ability to delete planks well not not I'll be honest. No, I don't think so. I don't think the math works that way. Um, the The difference is it, it is going to make it relatively more difficult. The problem with the prior language, at least from the view of the members of the committee that voted for it, was that the existing language of five tokens and 20% of the delegates allowed, a sign allowed planks to be brought up for a vote very easily. Like that had nowhere near, potentially at least, nowhere near 50% support to delete. So I think that the the intention, at least behind Proposal I, feel however you feel about Proposal E, is to only bring up those, uh, those planks which have a much more reasonable shot of passing. If I could weigh in uh, real oh, quick. Yeah, um, sure, Dr. Bowman. I... Uh, I... I actually favor proposal I, do not favor proposal E. Um, there were some members of the committee, uh, including Mr. Molman, who is no longer on the committee because he resigned, who uh, strongly believe that the threshold should be one third. Uh, I tend to think the threshold should be right where it is of one half for deletion. Um, it's possible there might be a minority report on that particular proposal, um, but, but all of this was discussed robustly by the committee and the committee voted this with full knowledge of these issues. And I All did- right. well, uh, thanks for speaking to it. And Well, thank you, um, Mr. Conrad. I'm gonna add some things to it and perhaps I, I see um, Ms. Arrowwood might as well, but I do have the rationale and it is in chat, but I wanna read it for the video that was um, inadvertently duplicated uh, in the report. So. Here was the rationale. This isn't entirely wordsmith, but it'll give you an idea on proposal I. It says there is a very low threshold in a cumulative voting exercise to force a vote on platform deletion. This has caused resentment amongst some who wish to see the entire process eliminated. However, having this in place keeps the platform committee from trying to gut sections of the platform if a majority simply doesn't like a plank and keeps them focused on refining, leaving a power of popular deletion with the delegates. So there needs to be a compromise solution that doesn't allow such a small group to wield so much power and potentially cause dissension. Um, I'm the one who brought this proposal and it's because there's been growing movement amongst the party to just delete the token process altogether. If this isn't changed, this token process is going away. Um, I've been around long enough to, to and particularly since the abortion plank was deleted last time, the resentment has only grown higher. And I like the token process and would like to come up with a way to keep it without having, it's less than 20% of the delegates can force a vote. Um, even though they did successfully delete the abortion plank last time, we're not going to get into a debate as to who agreed with that, who didn't. Um, for like 15 years, I, or I don't, it could be longer, Dr. Moulton would know. Every, well, since 2008, when that current language was put in, 
on the abortion plank, it came up for a deletion vote every single time. And people were getting tired of that. And then some platform committees, this happened in 2016, also recommended it for deletion. And it was felt like there was two bites of the apple. And that really caused a lot of dissension. So I'd like Rule 5 to still exist, but it is not going to exist much longer if it stays in its current form. So this becomes a, in the committee's opinion, or at least the majority, this was the arguments made, that it's better to have a process rather than risk losing that power altogether. Um, this happens to be a, a meet in the middle type thing rather than an all or nothing thing. Did you want to hear this? No, she looked, I just made a. Okay, um, Mr. Madden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would just like to point out that we're still talking about proposal I. Um, the easier it is to pass something, the easier it is to pass something bad, and the harder it is to remove something, the harder it is to remove something bad. And uh, following this logic, I believe that it is inherently an issue if we have it easier to pass something and harder to remove something. So uh, my comment is as follows. I believe that if we're going to have this compromise, as you say, then I believe the compromise is what's currently in bylaw. <clears throat> That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Madden. I think you're dealing with two separate issues. One is the vote threshold for deletion and the token, though they are related, um, they aren't entirely the same issue. It's a matter of the number of people that can force a vote. What the vote threshold ends up being is a separate proposal. So they're, they're, they're considered independently, but do appreciate your comment. Um, I want to speak slightly, and though anyone on the platform committee, excuse me, bylaws committee who is in favor of raising the deletion threshold to two thirds, if you wish to speak. Um, a deletion is just a form of amendment and the platform can be amended by two thirds. Uh, what happens is, as, you, it, as is said, it takes two thirds to pass it, which means that when it was passed, it had wide popular support. And what can happen is that in a convention in which there can be an aberration, uh, 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 I'm really going to need to ask people to mute that are not speaking, please. I think that was you, Mr. Madden, this time. Thank you. Um, can, can, can delete planks that are then much harder to get back in when when they were put in, they had a wide majority of support. Um, I happen to have the opposite opinion that it should be harder to it, it should be equally hard to put it in. But if we were going to make something harder, it should be harder to, to delete than to add. Um, our platform needs to be stable and having differing thresholds leads to a lack of stability. And our platform right now is pretty stable. And I know a lot of people were deeply resentful over the abortion plank being able to be deleted with a 50% vote. And without saying my opinion on that vote, I happen to think that any plank getting deleted with 50% is going to cause resentment. I'm going to give another example. In 2016, I can name this caucus because it no longer exists. We're not going to get into criticizing or supporting any particular faction on this committee. Um, but there used to be a caucus that that hated Rule 5 and wanted to change it. So what they did is they targeted a plank that they didn't even care about, which was the omissions plank, and wanted to prove a point about how easy it was to delete a plank. And they almost got the omissions plank deleted through a stunt to prove a point. And our platform should not be a tool to prove a point and be susceptible to stunts. 
And that, in fact, did happen in 2016. You could probably, anyone offline, I can give you the name of the caucus. You could probably still find their webpage where they talked about how they wanted to delete the omissions point just to prove a point. Um, don't really want to, somebody could go to the Wayback Machine, but contact me offline if you're interested in that. Okay, further, raise your hands. Don't be shy, folks. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we'll just start talking. I'm taking a look at the chat now as well. I see Paul's giving the math. I'm not a mathy. Hey, what we'll, we'll do then is, um, I, I think we left off around L last time. Oh, I see. Oh, God, Mark, I always get your last name wrong, and I don't want to mispronounce it. So, Mark K. Uh, 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 thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Karen. And it's, uh, it's Captain Good or Captain Good. Um, uh, so, my concern is uh, with uh, Proposal F, uh, actually. Actually, it is. Uh, it would probably what I am uh, going to say uh, would qualify as a new amendment. I'm sorry, I was not able to uh, uh, to attend the previous uh, town hall. Um, namely, um, uh, in the last two conventions, there were uh, there was a procedure when uh, after a first, uh, I think it was uh, uh, with uh, election of chair in 2020 and election of vice chair in election of 2022. When after uh, uh, the first one or two rounds of votes, uh, the leaders became known, and then the, uh, there was a motion from the floor to suspend the rules and uh, short circuit the process and just go to the uh, uh, top two, um, top two, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, top two uh, contenders uh, run off. Uh, I found uh, I found that uh, disconcerting because uh, for me it reads as if we were uh, changing the process uh, of voting uh, for office while the voting is underway. And I brought this issue from the floor at the 2022 convention. Uh, there was a healthy debate about it. Uh, um, Ken ruled it uh, um, against me. So my uh, so I would suggest to the committee uh, in this Article 15 which is now modified by proposal uh, f uh, as a, uh, to restrict ability of, uh, of the body to change the uh, uh, to change uh, the procedure while the voting essential for this office is underway and it can be done at the discretion of the committee by end adding a sentence such as uh, more than one candidate uh, removal of more than one candidate shall require seven eighths vote or uh, removal, uh, uh, removal of more than one candidate sh uh, shall be out of order, or other ver version of it. That uh, uh, there are multiple ways of achieving it. Uh, I would leave it up to the con uh, committee, or I can submit uh, the language. Perhaps my memory is faulty, and I'm looking up the convention minutes right now. I I don't think we dropped um, candidates in that way in 2022. Um, I'm pulling up the convention minutes um, now. I know there was healthy debate. And the reason for this proposal is because the wording of it is the way it is now. No, you, you, you can't just drop candidates. Um, so that's that's why I, I, I want to look, in, unless there's a rule for it. And this particular article, if you took it really literally, meant that you could only drop the candidate receiving the fewest votes only in round one. And it had been our custom to do that with each subsequent round, but it was only dropping one, one candidate. And that's what inspired this proposal because there was an ambiguity that there was a lot of debate over but maybe Mr. Seebeck has something to say here because I don't think, and he was head teller, so he would probably remember, I don't think we did a bulk drop of candidates in 2022. We went like six rounds in the vice chair. I think what happened is those two ended up being the last two standing I, through this process. I don't think there was a bulk drop. Mr. Seebeck, do you recall? 
there was not a bulk drop um, for those races. Uh, we had tallies for multiple rounds for vice chair, and at each round, when a majority was not reached, we dropped the lowest person and was allowed to give their uh, concession or endorsement speech and we moved on to the next round. Um, there was discussion in Reno regarding this particular issue. Um, the, the motion to suspend the rules, as uh, Mr. Kaplan uh, remembers, did happen. It was proposed by Mr. Starr. Um, and Mr. Melman, acting as chair of the convention at this point, had ruled that the, most, the motion was actually out of order because custom had already dictated what we were doing, and therefore there was no need to do it. And then the body continued with that general direction. We did propose this in the committee, and I, I believe it passed unanimously by us, um, for this proposal to just codify to keep it going a certain way. Um, speaking as head teller, the system of dropping can multiple candidates only occurs in one specific case. And if I remember correctly, it has to do with not achieving, I believe it's a 5% threshold on the first ballot for certain races. And I think it might be the presidential nomination, but I could be wrong. I know there's one specific one there. But the rest of the time, we've just gone with the drop the, drop the lowest and, and keep on trucking. Yeah, because uh, otherwise again. you can't drop candidates. Um, right. So I, I'm looking at the LNC vice chair round one. And I, I'm not saying this to embarrass anyone. I'm just trying to give some factual detail. In round one, um, Mr. D. Orazio was dropped. In round two, let me see here. Um, we might need to look at the minutes because it looks like um, there were some multiples. Now, I don't know whether people dropped out. At that this... did happen. A couple of them, a, a couple of candidate, uh, candidates did drop out in between races. Okay, because oh, they're on the court. I show in round two that Mr. I believe Mr. Rasher was dropped and then Mr. Flores and Mr. Hopman might have dropped out. And then they did. in round three was a head to head um, between Mr. Smith and Mr. Rodsef. But I don't believe we, sus we suspended the rules to drop more than one candidate. I don't recall that happening either. But um, I, I can take a look because Ms., because obviously Mark's um, recollection is different. So well, the motion the motion was definitely made and it was definitely debated. <laughs> uh, if, if, if I may comment, uh, sure. Uh, uh, I think for purposes of the bylaws discussion, it is more relevant uh, whether uh, uh, the, the more relevant is not historical circumstances of when uh, when specifically this bulk removal uh, attempt was attempted. But that such attempts were made, and in uh, amending uh, amending this section so that bulk, bulk removals from the floor cannot be uh, permitted would streamline this issue for uh, 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 regardless of what happened in the past convention. Okay, I think, and uh, no, I, I'm just really curious, and I think, Mr. Seebeck, that both you and I are incorrect because I am looking at the minutes and. Um, election of LNC vice chair round two results. Um, no candidate received a majority. And as per the prior suspension of the rules, so there was a suspension of the rules, Alex Flores, Joe Hopman, and Christopher Thrasher were eliminated. So it seems like there was a suspension of the rules. I stand corrected then. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't recall that that just seemed Oh, so Aaron Starr moved to suspend the rules to limit the third round to the top two. A mm -hmm. point of order was raised that mm -hmm. amounted to changing the voting rules before the results of round two were even announced. That's right. That's why it was ruled out of order, because the timing was wrong. <laughs> and then, okay, the chair, uh, then there was a... Uh, Omar appealed the ruling of the chair. 
the ruling of the chair was sustained and then after the results let me see here oh no okay here we go someone raised the point of order that it couldn't happen the chair ruled the point of order not well taken allowing the suspension of the rules to happen Omar appealed the ruling. The ruling of the chair was sustained. Thereby, thereafter, the motion to suspend the rules to limit the third round of voting to the top two candidates passed upon a show of hands. So Mark's recollection was, in fact, correct. And I believe that it was my point of order that was deemed not well taken. It said Omar Rukiro. You both uh, might, may, have got, might have gotten maybe. to the mic at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But to, to reiterate, my my ask for the bylaws committee is to revisit this uh, this issue and include the language that would uh, uh, restrict uh, bulk removal, maybe by raising the threat the threshold for of seven eights or uh, deeming it out of order, or other methods. Because in, my contention is that uh, bulk removal of candidates as uh, changes substantively the voting procedure uh, rather than we have uh, incremental uh, one by one removal uh, we are going to uh, we were going to run off of the top two candidates and the uh, dynamic of such races is uh, substantively difficult uh, di different in political sense hey um i appreciate it and i'm sure the committee will take that to heart i i see mr Bracco's hand raised i'll i'll call upon him but what I really thank you for, Mark, I, obviously for the suggestion, but the fact that you stumped both me and Mr. Seabeck on our recollection, that does not happen often. I need to get you, if I'm going to see you in D.C., I need to get you a little trophy because uh, congratulations, that was really good. I'm impressed with your memory. Uh, Mr. Bracco. So I'm not, I'm not sure if this would actually qualify, but Perhaps this is a good opportunity to speak to bylaws in the nature of a rule of order and their ability to be suspended or not. Um, correct. But I I wasn't going to get into that technicality, but I that did also come up at the convention. There's a footnote. Alicia Matson, California, provided information to the convention that she believes bylaws article 15.2 is a bylaw in the nature of a rule of order and would not need to be amended in order to accomplish the goal of dropping multiple candidates in subsequent rounds, but rather could be suspended. Um, but in order to accomplish what um, Mark had said, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful by using your first name, I just don't want to mangle your last name. I know you've pronounced it for me, but I'm terrible with pronunciations. Uh, that's okay. Um, Thank you. Um, it, the the bylaw could say it couldn't be suspended. I mean, you can do that with bylaws in the nature of a rule of order. Now, whether the committee wishes to take that up is another matter, but it can be done. So just, uh, it, it, I think what Mr. Bracco wanted me to explain slightly is there generally if someone asks you can a bylaw be suspended 99 percent of the time you will be correct in in well-written bylaws um for your answer to be no they cannot however if there is a bylaw that is in the nature of a rule of order which um this one very arguably is it can be suspended and that's what ms matson uh was stating and that's why there was a motion to suspend the rules in Reno that neither Mike nor I recall, but that was quite a crazy convention. Uh, uh, may, may I comment again? Um, yes. Uh, now, uh, uh, here we have an interesting mathematical collusion because uh, uh, normally for suspension of the rules, uh, uh, suspension of the, ru of the rules requires two third vote. And at the same time, when we have uh, multiple candidates, uh, it is uh, not unusual to have a pr uh, something like, say, forty percent, thirty-five percent, and then uh, and then uh, a long tail. So uh, the dynamic is that these two, two top uh, uh, the camps of these two two candidates uh, by themselves may frequently constitute these two third votes that that by Roberts unrelated uh, required to suspend this rule. 
So in this sense, my initial proposal when I uh, opened this uh, conversation was to raise, uh, to, uh, uh, to specifically say, here the suspension of this rule shall require seven eighths vote. Uh, and uh, for purpose of the election, that would occur only when uh, the trailing candidates have a uh, minuscule amount of votes, if that make, if I'm making sense with this. Yeah, we, I do appreciate that, Mark. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? <laughs> All right, well, then we're just going to start talking and... If anyone has, I see Mr. Madden. Go ahead, Mr. Madden. Oh, geez. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, Sil Sylvia talks to herself, and she's always very interesting. I'm going to mute you, Sylvia. <laughs> Mr. Madden <laughs> thought you were referring to him. <laughs> sorry, Sylvia. She wasn't, refer she wasn't referring to you, Mr. Madden. She's doing <laughs> some work, I can see. Got it. Okay. Um well, yes. So there, there was a recent bylaws proposal passed that I believe has some good stuff in it, but I think it should be divided from the other part that I think may not be even yeah. worth considering. Um, there, so the there's a change to the at large um, uh, rep, uh, not representatives. What the hell are they called? Uh, LNC members. You come at the regional representatives? No, the, there's a change to the at larges in terms of the voting process for them, which is cumulative voting. Yeah, that's, I believe the yes. And and it's it's part of a two part proposal. I believe that that should be considered separately. And I believe I, I'm much in favor of, of this amendment. I think that cumulative voting, at, as uh, Dr. Moulton has advocated for, uh, is a beautiful thing. And uh, I believe that, it, you know, in multi-winner races, it's uh, the best of the best. Now, the other part of it, which uh, essentially rids the LNC of uh, regional representation, uh, I've stated my uh, beliefs on that before, but I'll state it here again so that uh, the present company can hear it. Uh, I, I think that this is a terrible mistake. I think that when we get rid of uh, any kind of geographical representation, then uh, we lose the connection to our affiliates at the LNC uh, because obviously national interests and state interests don't always align. And, you know, it, the right now what we have is a balance of the two. Uh, and I'm, I personally believe that that balance isn't... Uh, entirely equal uh but i do think that the interests of the states should be more represented more representative um but this as it stands right now with with the current uh makeup of the lnc i think that that's sufficient enough especially if the alternative uh currently proposed by this committee is to rid them all together Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Madden. Uh, that probably could be an issue that gets raised on the floor. I think you were at the meeting. The um, the I know the sense of at least the majority of the bylaws committee was that the two uh, one would not be proposed without the other, and we would oppose division. Now, that's obviously going to be up to uh, the body um, on the floor. But I know the bylaws committee itself is, is opposed to division. But committees just make recommendations. It will be ultimately up to the body um, in the floor. I have a feeling the, the, the regional one's going to be the one that has the most discussion. So if any other members would like to weigh on this, particularly other committee members, uh, this passed, I believe, unanimous. I don't want to call it yet. I don't remember. I did vote for it. So I think it was it 10 to 0. It might have been um, 9 to 1. 
been on the LNC since 2016, started out as a regional representative. So I have a bias towards the regional system in that I used to be region one representative. The regional system does not work. It does not do what it allegedly claims to do. And it creates a potential legal liability for the LNC in that if you have a regional representative that completely runs afoul of their fiduciary responsibilities, the LNC has absolutely no ability to do anything about it except for do things that, so you get into this weird situation. How many, I don't want to be using anyone but myself as an example, because I can talk about myself all I, all I choose to. Um, back when there was the unfortunate incident last term when, uh, you know, a, a super majority of the LNC decided they didn't like their mouthy secretary and they um, removed me without due process as the convention overturned. There was another issue there that never really came to light that if I had wanted to, I think I could have made some legal trouble for the LNC. I wouldn't do that, just chose not to. And that they made all of this kind of disciplinary issues public. Like some really gross stuff, public. Um, the LNC itself, if a regional representative legitimately did something worthy of removal, they don't have removal power. And then you just have to allow someone on your top committee uh, who's just grossly violating the rules and you have to count upon the state chairs to do a removal. Well, very often the state chairs go, that's national's problem. Why do we have to deal with it? This happened um, in region one where our regional representative was asked to resign and they felt very resentful about it that national was sloughing its problems off on them. And I don't think what they thought was entirely unfair. They're trying to run their states. So if you get in a position where the regional chair is like saying, that's your problem, we don't want to deal with it. Well, the LNC can't deal with it. And then we get into an issue of potential unresolvable breach of fiduciary duty. Now, what the LNC can do, but this will look terrible to the members, but we'll be forced into it by very unfortunate structure is the LNC can delegate its power, which means if there was a regional representative that was running amok, what the LNC could do is delegate its entire power to a subcommittee comprising everybody but the rogue regional. And that would be an even worsely divisive situation, but the LNC would be forced into such a situation by the fact that it has no authority over regionals. To have a board in that position, particularly when there are divided duties, is your duty to the region or is it to the party as a whole? DC law says it's to the party as a whole. However, that's not the way it's viewed by the membership. The LNC's responsibilities are very, very narrow people expect far too much out of it. Um, there should not be regional interests. There are national interests that we take care of. Regions can always band together to take care, uh, states, I mean, can always band together to take care of things that they wish to take care of. It doesn't require the LNC. I would encourage more states to do things independently of, of projects where they kind of treat themselves almost as a caucus, um, where it'd be like, oh, we're the mountain states caucus, where they band together to do things outside of the LNC. We talk about decentralization a lot, but everyone looks to daddy LNC for everything. And it, it, it shouldn't be that way. The size of the LNC is way too big. Every board governance expert that we have consulted has said it's way too big. 11 members is about ideal. And that's what this is putting that down to and having them be at large so that they are responsible to the party as a whole. Um, I'm going to say one more thing and I'm going to get to Mr. Latham and Mr. Conrad. Dr. Moulton 
made a joke about me when I was region one. That was a true joke. That's why I still laugh about it. But to me, this exemplifies the problem. Region one has great ballot access. So the national party raises a lot of money for ballot access and spends a lot of money for ballot access. But as region one representative, my states were saying to me, why should we encourage people to be national members? We're not getting any of this money. And it put kind of like the national interest pitted against the region one interest. So I just started lobbying to get candidate support for region one candidates that wouldn't even have been considered in other regions. And Dr. Moulton joked that Ms. Harlos is bringing home the pork for region one. And the reason why the joke is funny is because there was some truth in it. And this system incentivizes that. It absolutely does not work. And um, as I've said in, in the strongest possible terms, in my opinion, the regional system needs to die in a fire screaming for its mother. That's how strongly I feel about it. And I've never seen Dr. Moulton so excited about anything either when we talked about the fact that this needs to be done. Um, and the majority of the current LNC, I think, was even at that meeting saying the same thing. And I think the majority of the past LNC would have said the same thing as well. No LNC I've been on ever thought the regional system was good. The people who think it's good, it's people who haven't had to deal with it at the governance level. And again, I think I was a good regional representative and I still want to do away with that position. Um, Mr. Latham, then Mr. Conrad. Yeah, just real quick. I think regional interest can be expressed through the process that we propose, the cum cumulative voting process. If you know there are enough people saying this region's being neglected and needs some national attention in some way, you know they can lump their votes together and and vote for a candidate for at large member who can address those issues. And as I've said, in favor of electoral reforms like proportional representation. Um, I had a representative in Congress, and his name is Ron Paul, but he lives in Texas, even though I'm from Utah. Or I had a representative, um, but his name is Justin Amash, and he lives in Michigan. So I, as a you know Libertarian Party lifetime member, don't mind if there's an at-large member who lives in New York or who lives in California who votes in line, you know, in favor of things that I want to get done on the LNC. Um, so. So, but yeah, if if uh, I think an issue becomes so critical that it needs regional attention, I have to believe that the membership will be motivated to maybe elect a person from, say, the southeastern United States or the northwestern United States to really focus on what may need to be done in that area. That's it. Um, thank you, Mr. Latham. And that is just to add, that is why I think the committee felt that cumulative voting, we are opposed to division because we're not seeking to eliminate regionals without having a mechanism for special interests. I'd rather refer to it that way or particular interests or focus interest groups to be able to pull their votes and get a voice on the LNC, whether or not the people might happen to live, some of them in South Florida, and some of them in northern Alaska that might happen to have a particular interest, such as, uh, even though I know the mountain states tend to have this, there have been people in the party that have had a particular interest in um, the status of indigenous peoples and, uh, you know, Native American rights and, and, and things of the sort. Well, there are various states that that's not an issue at all. And then there's some states where that's a huge issue. And believe it or not, it's a big issue in Florida, but not necessarily in Region 2. Um, I'm pulling this issue just out of the air. And people who really wanted a strong voice for that issue could band together with members all over the country. And those same members maybe have another issue that they have in common with other people. This will allow motivated people using cumulative voting to even more accurately have their interests represented. Because the fact is, 
the minute national convention ends, it's in the hands of your state chairs. It's not even in the hands of the members any longer. Um, Mr. Conrad, then Mr. Jacobs. Yeah, um, I serve on a state board, but I am not a state chair. So I have no access to my regional rep. Um, I have found it far more effective to use the um, email contact tool on the LNC website than to try to, and uh, I will say in fairness, I am in a regionless state. So maybe uh, the, the vice chair just has too much going on to really give as much attention to us as a dedicated region rep would. Um, but I've had, I don't know, three or four different vice chairs uh, that have basically done nothing for me as a member of a state board. So- What state uh, are you in, um, Mr. Conrad? Alaska. So I was really resonating with your example of like Native Alaskans and American Indians. Uh, yeah, that's a yeah. big issue for us up here too. Yeah, I used to represent Alaska. And I know the it's funny because the states that used to be in region one, that, that issue is always on my mind because it was a big interest. And because both Alaska and Hawaii, people wouldn't think of commonalities between those two. But the Native, the indigenous populations in both of those have some really aligned issues. It's kind of going off the beaten trail, but being region one representative got me really interested in that. And as a native South Floridian, it struck me how Alaska and Florida have those issues in common and you wouldn't think that they would. Um, but okay. there actually is large indigenous uh, populations in, in Florida. So all that is to say, the region system sounds like it's really helpful for the states, but that has not been my experience. And I will uh, go on mute again. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Conrad, Mr. Jacobs, and then Ms. Callan. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I uh, just wanted to say that I have been following the workings of this committee for the last six months or so religiously. Uh, I had some real problems with the, with your first draft, uh, which was defeated on restructuring. I do not have that problem with this particular draft because of cumulative voting. I was very worried. Now, uh, let's just be blunt here. If you're going to have somebody try to take over the party, you're probably going to call me. Um... It's, you know, to do something at a convention. I'm probably the guy that you would call. I was very worried that there could be a takeover or that this would make a something very easy for a takeover by some outside party. The cumulative voting helps prevent that. And I think that that is a very, very good thing to have along with these other things that have been mentioned. This makes that proposal. And I would encourage that to be kept together with the restructuring proposal. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Before I call on Ms. Callan, I could tell you my interest first became interested in cumulative voting in my years on the Radical Caucus, because for many years, the Radicals felt like they never had a voice. And they would be able to pool their votes together, similar to the token process, and at least ensure a seat on at least one seat on the LNC. Um, so it does allow minority voting blocks, whether or not they are members scattered within multiple states to have their voice heard, particularly if you happen to be a more pragmatic member in a radical region, what would have been a region or vice versa. This allows more of individual members and not concentrating it at the state chair level. And I can tell you in the current region one, and it's probably because they're busy in their own state, but we have one state chair that doesn't weigh in on anything. It doesn't work. Um, Ms. Callan. Hi, I just um, had a question about proposal P and the single winner elections. Um, it looks like you're retaining in the proposal the um, pri uh, for the most part the primary method of voting, which is the uh, rounds of elimination um, and and recounting 
and re-voting. And I'm just curious what the reason is for that, because um, I understand that in the past that was a bit of an administrative burden. And so I'm wondering why you um, didn't go with a voting method where people can submit their ballot and then it's you know counted all at once with rankings or scores or something. Well, there is a there is separate proposals for rank choice. Um, there's also an electronic voting one. Proposal P doesn't change anything substantive. It combines a bunch of scattered rules into one rule. Because as happens over convention, um, you kind of collect rules and bylaws and language like barnacles. And every once in a while, you need to scrape them into a bucket <laughs> and kind of like assemble it into something coherent. So proposal P um, just consolidated them all and made them clear. There's no substantive change happening in proposal P. There are other proposals suggesting rank choice for certain offices and also electronic voting. I don't know if that answered your question. Okay, I, I'll have to reread it. I. I was thinking the proposal P was um, for all of the elections, but I'll take another look at it. Okay, thank you, um, Ms. Callan. Uh, is there anyone with anything else? And I do remind everyone, um, not all of these proposals are going to be heard. Unless there's like motions to call the question immediately on every single one and we just pass them all. But realistically um the committee has four hours and it sounds like a long time but we figured it out and it was something like probably 18 proposals will get heard we've got over what 34 so there is going to be some pairing down now obviously some of them are much more complicated than others mr jacobs madam chairman uh i'm not certain which number the proposal or which letter the proposal is but the one dealing with uh, the codification on state dis dis disaffiliation? Yes, that is. Let me go up to the index. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, EE. EE. -E. Mm -hmm. And also for everyone's edification, if you're like keeping track of these letters, they are going to go away by the time uh, we get to convention. Uh, they'll be numbered then because some of these are, we're going to reorder them and do all sorts of things, but I'll produce an index in case anyone was like, we're just going to use EE as an example. I really love DE. Oh my God, which one is it now? I'll have an index for any member who's interested that will say EE now proposal three or something like that. Um, just an FYI, the letters are for when they're before they're in a final report, the final report will have proposal numbers. Okay, but I have it up on the screen, Mr. Jacobs. Okay, uh, you've called another proposal, one of the most important proposals. I would have to say that this ranks as a tie or a close second. This is a codification of the disaffiliation process for a state uh, affiliate. It provides very uh, very definitely for the situation where there is a membership dispute or there is a dispute as to who the chairman is within the party uh at, within the state party uh how that is resolved uh it is the first time it is codified in your bylaws uh specifically and it does retain very strongly the, uh, I should say it does two things. First of all, it relies very heavily on what the state does under its rules. And secondly, it uh, does not give the LNC the final word on the matter. Their decision can be appealed to the judicial committee. I think that both of those things strike a very good um I shouldn't say strike, they serve as a very good buttress to uh, affiliate rights. And I think that this is a good proposal and I would encourage this to be placed very, very quickly on and to be adopted with minimal fanfare. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Jacobs. I think it was Mr. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Moulton belie believed elimination of regionals was the most important. Um, I don't know if Dr. Moulton is still here. I certainly don't want to put words in his mouth. Um, I do think that is up there. I believe this is up there. I do see your hand, Mr. Rella. I'll call upon you in one moment. I think the uh, also the proposal on codifying due process rights for removal of LNC members is up there. Um, so I, I certainly have a top five. Uh, I think everyone on the committee does and there's significant overlap in top fives. So there might be some outliers. Um, Mr. Roulette. Thank you. I agree with everything JJ just said, except that he said he wanted it passed with minimal fanfare. On um, these most important bylaws, uh, I hope that at the convention, there is a substantial amount of debate from the floor on these. Uh, I do think that debate on substantial issues is really good for us. I hope, in fact, that there is so much debate on these important ones that there are motions to expand, extend a time to debate when we get to uh, the convention on these most important ones. Like, we, we are, like I'm 100% I'm in favor of this proposal. I think it's the most important one. And but I uh, I hope people do take significant time doing for debate at the convention. Um, thank you, Mr. Roulette. Another one that I would add, as I think one of the most important ones, um, is the notice by law. It is absolutely insane that we don't require prior notice of bylaws amendments. And if you want to talk about fears of actual literal takeovers, not libertarians disagreeing, uh, notice is a huge protective mechanism. So I would definitely consider that there. Um, I, I think I'm going to agree more with JJ that I hope uh, ones like this where it's just one paragraph, I do hope they pass with minimal fanfare. Because one thing you can't say about our committee is that we didn't beat every horse that was even remotely twitching to death. Um, and that's a good thing. It, it got frustrating at times with some, with some folks. We've spent three meetings on one proposal before. It's a very thorough bylaws committee. The ones that are maybe more complex, this particular proposal I hope passes with little fanfare because it, it codifies with the procedure has been for a while now, but puts it all in one place and makes it clear. I don't think there's anything really controversial. Well, I don't want to say controversial, but there isn't anything that isn't what the practice pretty much has been. Um, if you want to call it implications of the current bylaws, I, I do think it's more than implications, um, but it, makes it more understandable. Some of the other really important ones, like the regional thing, yeah, that that's going to need some good debate. People need to feel comfortable with it. Um, I do see a, a comment um, from Ms. Callan um, in chat where she said that she heard that cumulative voting is susceptible to being gamed. Um, that's, it, it's, that's always a strange phrase. I, I'm not saying you're, you're strange for saying it. I, I've heard that before. Cum, uh, gaming sometimes uh, is, has a negative connotation when to me, it's, how do how how do you even put this? Um, it is susceptible to being gamed, might be the right word, without the negative commutation. Um, cumulative voting is a, a a voting method that is designed to be wielded strategically. To people on the losing side, sometimes of those kinds of votes, we'll call it gaming to have the negative connotation. Um, but can it be strategically used? Yes. And that's the whole purpose of it. So I kind of consider that a feature and not a bug, allowing minority voices to be able 
to strategically vote in a way that's not possible in, a, in just a majority vote. So I think sometimes the, the connotations or lack thereof of the word game always depends upon the whether somebody is happy or not happy with the results. But is it highly susceptible to strategic voting? Yes, and that's by design. Mr. Bracco. You had mentioned the notice, um, and if nobody has a specific question on something else, maybe that would be good to cover. I believe that's proposal O. Yeah, and that one is somewhat complex. Uh, it Well, it looks more complex than it actually is. Um, people see a lot of changes and sometimes they, they get gun shy. So the issue here is when you go to convention, um, the bylaws committee isn't even required by the bylaws to submit a report ahead of time. We're been very on the ball on this bylaws committee. We've been meeting for over a year now. That's really unusual. And we're hoping to have our report out soon. Um, it's going to be up to the committee, but, but certainly more in advance than is typically done. And uh, Roberts and pretty much uh, probably any parliamentary authority will tell you you should not be able to amend your bylaws without notice. Notice lets people know whether or not they want to be at this convention. And if you have a literal hostile outside group, a, one of the duopoly parties say, who all of a sudden were threatened by the LP, um, with just a little planning, they could easily take us over. Um, they'd need to plan more into the year before because they're Fortunately, some states have seasoning requirements, which every state should have, in my opinion. Um, but you go into convention sometimes blind. So adding a notice requirement allows people to become educated about the bylaws proposals as they're coming into convention to caucus about them. And I don't mean caucus in like this factional way. I mean, uh, have group discussions about them. And uh, things like this town hall that we're having, but even on smaller scales within the state in order to have informed opinions and not make rash decisions on the floor. And sometimes some of the most unfortunate bylaws, and I'm not necessarily saying this has happened on national, but I'm sure it has, but I've seen it happen in organizations, uh, is when something is done on the spur of the moment from the floor. It should be very difficult to do a bylaws amendment from the floor because that is um, by uh, amending the existential structure of your organization by ambush, potentially. There should always be sufficient notice so that delegates know what they're getting into. I come from a state where we've had bare... While we may have had controversies and drama, we haven't had issues where, oh, my God, that bylaw sucked and it just screwed up the entire organization. And one reason for that is our very robust notice requirements, as is best practice. You typically will see no notice requirements in smaller or, or organizations that don't have as much impact. But for Pete's sake, we're the we're the nation's third largest political party and our national bylaws don't require notice. Insane isn't sufficient to describe how bad of a situation this is. So this amendment would require the both the platform and the bylaws committee to produce reports ahead of time. Um, and then scope of notice would come into play and would still allow amendments from the floor, but they would require a petition of a certain amount of party members to show sufficient support. So you don't have some weird harebrained idea at the mic. Now I know you'd have to suspend the rules to hear it, but generally at the beginning, anyone who's been to enough LP conventions knows for some reason at the beginning of convention, delegates kind of are pretty 
easy going about suspending the rules. They'll suspend the rules to hear a resolution that birds aren't real. They'll suspend the rules to hear a resolution that the chair election should be decided by a mud wrestling thing. And then as we realize we're running out of time at the end of convention, then all of a sudden everything is is rushed and, and terrible. So having this where it would require some showing of support before going to the mic, um, then you wouldn't have to suspend suspend the rules because there would be a notice for it. Um, and then without prior notice, it, it has a much higher threshold. I know I kind of got a bit jumbled there because it's been a while since I've looked at this, but this will protect the party and lead to more educated delegates. So will not preclude motions from the floor entirely, particularly if some if we end up like in a COVID situation again, where we need to have a special rule just for that convention, though I'd never recommend a hybrid convention again, but that's just me. Other people might want to do it. It would still allow it to be done, but it would be a higher vote threshold in case some emergency situation came into play. So we have the best of both worlds. I don't know if anyone else on the committee wants to speak to that because that was kind of long-winded of me. Uh, Mr. Bracco. So I think an important part of this proposal that you haven't spoken to yet is the um, it, like the, the notice requirements. Yes, but also the uh, I think it's one B on your screen here. Article 17, one B. Um, that's that creates the method for party members to petition for a proposal either platform or bylaws mm -hmm. and then for if you were to scroll down to rule one there is actually sections of the the convention rules that would provide for that as an agenda item so i think in addition to creating the the notice which i agree is an important thing um, this also allows party members, if there's sufficient support, I believe the number we had is 50 sustaining members, um, five zero, um, just yeah. in, in case it wasn't clear, if not 15, um, to petition for a particular change and get, I guess technically the, the committee reports come first, but I mean, pretty close to peer level privilege as the committee reports. Yeah, I did neglect to mention that right now, um, because people would have to do a suspension of the rules to have something heard, um, the weight of, and, and, and there's good reason for this, but I think there's a balancing act. Um, committees, the bylaws committee and the platform committee are highly privileged in that regard in that our proposals, unless the order of business is amended and those items of business are deleted. Our proposals, at least some of them are going to get heard. Whereas there could be a significant voting block of members that want to have something heard and, and they're not on even footing. So if you could get 50 bylaw sustaining members and they don't have to be delegates. So this also allows for people who are not going to be delegates at convention, but they are sustaining members they have skin in the game as long as they have a representative at convention to argue it for them. They get agenda time and other party members get to see their proposals because they're posted on the party website. But as a safeguard to keep something from perhaps somebody who has a great idea, but they're not quite as well versed in the rules or it might be worded a little roughly around the edges, it gets forwarded as sponsored to the respective committees. So in this case, it would be the bylaws committee who can choose to smooth out some of the rough edges and present it as part of their report because they see there's member support for it. So this evens the playing field as well. And thank you for reminding me of that. This has been a while since we've heard this one because we're what now on TT and this was O. <laughs> so we're like a whole alphabet ago. Well, that, that was my particular nit to pick with this proposal. 
Okay, well, let's go back here. We're just, again, um, anyone raise your hand, interrupt me. I'm just going to start going through things. Uh, was this here, Proposal L, yours, Mr. Bracco? I believe so, yes. Um, I don't think we talked about this before, and I think this might be something of interest to people. If you would like to just give a little explanation of it, and then we'll go on to the next one if there's no questions. Sure. So I don't know how many other others are familiar with the existing process for allocating delegates, but there's two parts. One is um, a, a larger part uh, is the percentage of the total national sustaining members that reside within your state. Um, and then a smaller part, um, this would be, so that first one is 3A in the existing rules, uh, ar sorry, Article 10, 3A. And the second part is Article 10, 3B. And that is the, the percentage um, of presidential votes cast in your particular state. Um, what this proposal is going to do, could, uh, Madam Chair, could you please scroll down to the changes? Okay. Um, so, is that good? Yeah, yes. I think that's fine. So what this would do is strike out the existing process and replace it with um, one, or point, one delegate for 0.1% of the sustaining membership. So this basically gets rid of the national of the presidential votes in 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 this and it places a higher weight upon the national sustaining membership. Um so if you were to so the existing rules was uh 0.14% of the national sustaining membership gets you a delegate in the existing rules and 0.35% of the um national presidential vote gets you a delegate um, that if you were to sort of add those up, that means that let's assume that nobody gets that or fraction thereof, there's a thousand delegates. And under this, uh, the, the new rules as well, if you were to add up like 0.1%, then that's also a thousand delegates. So it's not intended to shrink the delegate pool, um, there's probably going to be a little bit of that just because you're now rounding up only one number instead of two. But in terms of the target, the uh, baseline delegate counts, it's the same. It's just a different way of getting to it that encourages uh, sustaining membership over um, over the presidential vote. And if you don't mind, what what I would add that came up during debate and some because some people might go, but. We're a political party. Why would you want to disincentivize um, that particular part of the equation? Well, if you if you take states like New York, which has such terrible ballot access laws, they really are going to get the short end of the stick and get punished in delegate allocations through something that's not any fault of their own. This puts all the states on even keel, even opportunity for, for delegate allocations. With our widely varying uh, uh, ballot access laws, excuse me, I got tongue tied there for a moment. Um, it really does uh, um, disadvantage certain states. So that also um, was was a reason for it. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to add that because I know that was a big part of it. And I know certainly New York was um, looming heavy in my mind, certainly not my own state, at least for right now, though some outside big outside money is coming into Colorado to try to ruin it for us. Colorado has the best ballot access in the country. So this certainly wasn't um, more of a local interest for me, but it was out of sympathy for the states where things are so difficult. Um, Mr. Conrad. Uh, yeah, I guess I have two uh, things that came up for me when I was reading this proposal. 
One is that we, anyone who was at Reno saw the shenanigans Colorado can already pull. Like, I don't think giving them a bigger share of the delegates is necessarily going to be good for the well, national Come on party. now. There you go. <laughs> we, we want Colorado to have all the things. Yeah. But also, as a state with a smaller Which population is. than Ro- Rhode Island, like, uh, in most states, either the Libertarians or the Greens are the third largest party. In Alaska, it's the Independence Party, which is an explicitly secessionist party. But, uh, you know, the the Alaska Independence Party doesn't get a um, national U.S. presidential candidate on the ballot. So we have a lot of people who vote Libertarian but are not members of the Libertarian Party. And that represents our like addressable market um and i uh it seems like there should be some share of that represented uh at the national convention as well thank you mr conrad mr roulette who's a committee member in case everyone anyone forgot he's our troublemaker yeah uh two things for historical reference uh when this got brought up for debate last, like in, in 1980, it was also Alaska that insisted on having presidential votes count. But uh, uh, I believe you can be a sustaining member of the National Libertarian Party and also be a registered Alaska Independence Party member. I don't think that we insist on you not registering as a Democrat or a Republican or anything else. So if any of your members... Uh, want to be an Alaska independence person and also be a sustaining member of the Libertarian Party, they could be counted that way, I believe. Absolutely. Um, We don't... Bill Weld is still a life member, so I mean, I don't know if that's who I'd want to hold up as a shining example, but um, yeah, you can be a member of another political party or registered under another political party and be a sustaining member um, of the of the national of the national party. Um, partisan registration, how you vote, um, has nothing to do with it. Whereas in the presidential election, you only get one vote. So you, with sustaining members, somebody who still wishes to to, to vote elsewhere can and still help your state. Whereas you only get one presidential um, vote. Uh, but by the way, Mr. Conrad, the same people who did the jungle primary uh, tied to RCB in Alaska, they're trying that in Colorado right now. That, that's what I was referring to. And I'm a big RCB person, but not tied to a jungle primary. Um, they, they want top four and, and RCB. And that was wrote, a very difficult vote for me. Yeah, yeah, I did not like those two things bundled together. I will vote no if those two things are are bundled together. It's a poison pill to RCB, and I'm a, and I'm on the policy committee for RCB Colorado. Like I'm huge RCB person, but I I believe these people are doing this purposely to tank RCB because all you hear about with the complaints about what happened with the last the last Alaska thing, the problem with that wasn't RCB. It was the frickin' jungle primary, but it's RCB that is getting um, blamed for it. All right, uh, so just moving on again, if anyone has, uh, Mr. Bracco is disputing, by the way, just so we have the objection on the record that Mr. Rolat is is in fact the, the troublemaker. Um, M, I think is uh, pretty, non-controversial we have a few like this our committees don't have enough time uh and you wonder oh but some people might go yeah but bylaws started early um bylaws is a unique committee and that all of its members are appointed by the lnc so if the lnc appoints early they pretty much can give the committee all the time at once all of the other committees are mixed Meaning some of the appointees are the are by the LNC who can appoint whenever they want, and the other ones are by certain state parties who often wait till the last minute. And it does not give these state part these uh, committees anywhere near enough time. Three months for credentialing, which is this one, the next one is platform, is not nearly enough time. So we're expanding 
and I see Mr. Seebeck, who's going to want to, I think, speak on this. So we'll, we'll go to platform as well. So we see we, we're changing the timing of credentials to be no later than six months. And um, somewhere in here, we have platform. And I think we did platform six. What was it? Proposal K. Proposal it K, K is platform. Uh, 12 months. So uh, Mr. Seebeck. Yeah, just to reiterate that, being on both this committee and on the National Platform Committee and on my state bylaws committee, all at the same time, plus approaching uh, setting up for uh, teller duties for D.C., um, I, for one, have a huge plate full of stuff going on. And giving us more time on these committees to work through some of the stuff will help spread out the scheduling on these on these meetings and on this work to produce better work and to make it happen. We have the two years between conventions. There's no reason we have to wait to the last second, So, which is why these were proposed in the first place, to just let's take advantage of the time and spread them out. And I think part of the reason why they used to be so short is electronic meetings really weren't a thing. And a lot of this work, I mean, the Platform and Bylaws Committee in ye olden days, and I know it's not really pronounced ye, it was still the, even though it looked like a Y. Uh, they met for the first time a lot of times and did everything a couple of days before the convention on site. Um, but now that it's really easy to meet and, and, and do things at a more leisurely pace that doesn't burn out volunteers. And I do think presents a, a better work product. Why aren't we doing that? Mr. Conrad. It just strikes me that there's a disparity here when people earlier in the meeting said we should have the convention earlier. The rejoinder was, I'll tell the LNC to schedule the convention earlier. And now we have the same situation where the constraint is a deadline, but the LNC could have the committees meet earlier. It seems like to be consistent, the proper remedy would be to tell the committees to ask the LNC to convene them earlier. I, I think you misconstrued something. The LNC doesn't appoint these committees, these two. I may be confused. Yeah, if the LNC tends to appoint very early. If it were just the LNC, um, the LNC appointed this bylaws committee, which is why we've been meeting for a year. These, The platform committee and the credentials committee are blended committees, meaning that a portion of them is appointed by the LNC and the LNC made their credentials appointments six months ago or thereabouts. But the deadline for the states that get an appointee is February. So this just makes it so that the states who have to appoint don't, because whatever the deadline is, they're going to wait to the last minute. So while the states certainly are free to appoint early now, the reality is that they don't. Some do, but like the platform committee, 15 of the 20 seats are appointed by states, only five by the LNC. And all it takes is one state to wait to the last minute and the entire 20 person committee can't meet, um, which is what's happened every year and has happened in fact this, this time as well. Very well, objection withdrawn. All right, so next we were at M. Um, N is to limit committee alternates. Um, we have this weird thing where on committees, it says that states can appoint um, a representative and then um, ranked alternates may be named. There's no limit to it. And I can tell you Colorado, and this is against maybe Colorado's interest a little bit, because we've we've certainly taken advantage of this. The, the custom is that in committees, at least, that the alternates pretty much can debate freely. Um, and this is custom, but they don't get to vote. But having debate rights is almost as important sometimes depending on who it is as important as voting rights so you we can have a state where they appointed one platform committee 
their primary platform committee representative and one alternate, which makes sense. Well, I could tell you this term, Colorado appointed its platform committee representative and three alternates. And if they all come to the meetings and Colorado's got like four voices in debate, the point of alternates is to be able to sub in if your primary can't make it here and there. So it should be one alternate. It, it should be even for everybody. And so this would make it that um, an appointing body gets to appoint ranked alternates up to the number of its primary appointments. So um, if a state gets one appointment, it gets one alternate. Okay, we talked about notice requirements. P again is a consolidation. There's no substantive um, changes uh, in, um, in B. And it's quite extensive. That might be one of the ones that gets the chopping block in favor of more substantive ones, to be honest with you. Um, P1, is where the substantive change. So P, P1, we could, we'll talk about this as they relate them because I know we want to hear this and we might need to do some rewarding to hear it if we decide not to do P, but P1 would authorize um, electronic balloting. There's been many attempts over the years to allow electronic balloting at our conventions and they failed. Uh, so this proposal, in some ways, some people might say this isn't ideal. It is to at least get electronic balloting in the door to try to overcome some of the objections to why it didn't pass in the past convention in the past. Um, the preamble, it, the preamble exists in a no man's land where is it part of the platform or isn't it? What's the vote threshold to amend it? This deals with that. This isn't strictly theoretical. This came up in 2016. I believe it was 2016. You can go read the platform committee report. Um, there was a motion to strike the preamble and replace it with the Republic, uh, something like the Democrats want to get in your wallet and the Republicans want to get in your bedroom, which is a great bumper sticker. It doesn't, if you, okay, that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, R, oh, Mr. Seebeck. Um, yeah, just to add to that uh, previous one, the part of the concern was that the way that the amendments to the platform are based upon on had to do with wording of planks. And the question was whether the preamble was actually considered a plank. So that's why we put that in there to treat it the same as a plank so that it has the same thresholds. Not 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 including the SOP, of course, but that's a whole different double padlock uh, department. So it, it does make everything more consistent with uh, within the platform itself for amendment purposes. Correct. Um, proposal R would add RCB voting for officers, which is something we had mentioned before. Now, some of these changes I forgot to mention, such as notice requirements, let's because we talked about that one extensively, ones that would substantially change the character of the current convention. Um, if, if you're not aware, Unless there's provisos, bylaws changes go into effect immediately. You can really screw up an organization with an ill-timed bylaws proposal that could, like, for instance, cause you to lose quorum mid-convention if you amend your quorum requirements mid-convention because it goes into effect immediately. So any of these that would substantially change the character of the convention, with the exception of the regional representative one, which does not have a proviso because bylaws are heard before regional reps are elected, um, but ones that would like decredential people, which I know has been a big issue, we've taken care to put in provisos so that none of that happens. So same here, this, this, this won't affect anyone's rights, but it would wreak havoc upon the tellers 
if we change the voting process in the middle of the convention. Um, RCB takes a lot of preparation. So there would be a couple years for processes to get worked out. So there is a proviso that this would not go into effect until after convention, which means the next convention. So 2026 would be the first time it would be used. Um, same thing here with refining the definition of dues. Um, this gets kind of technical into uh, CRM issues, but in any event, um, because it, it, it does change the timing period of dues, it would not go into effect. This one doesn't say... Um, at the end of convention, it says it will go into effect as each person's lapse date comes up so that no one would be deprived of their current end date of sustaining members. Um, proposal T standardizes the committee procedures. Right now, there's just a weird disconnect between the platform committee and the bylaws committee with them being very similar committees, but having different procedures. This would make them have the same procedures. So minority reports and, and, and things like that. Um, proposal U, clean up affiliation language and responsibilities. Believe it or not, there's been an ongoing dispute in the party. And whenever there's a perceived ambiguity, it is the responsibility of the body to amend their bylaws to clear up the ambiguity. So one of the things on there, you can see in the last sentence under the markup copy for proposal U, the dispute has been, does an affiliate party have to provide the national secretary with a copy of its bylaws as they're amended, or is that just a one-time obligation? Yes, this has been an ongoing dispute. The intent of this was quite obviously so that there was always a current copy of the constitution or bylaws. So this makes it clear that it's a continuing um, obligation. And it also makes it clear that if for some reason there's not an affiliate in a state uh, and it comes time to affiliate, that the national committee is not obligated to um, take the first comer. Say you have five petitions for affiliation, it can then weigh those five petitions. It isn't a rush to get this to the national committee immediately. And funny business, this isn't also strictly theoretical. If anyone knows, and if you don't know, consider yourself blessed, but the situation that happened in Virginia on the same night that there was a vote to allegedly dissolve the party, which wasn't valid, but the people who did it thought it was, some of the same people that were kind of involved in that immediately filed a petition for affiliation. Like it was the weirdest thing. There was obviously something going on. The LNC is not obligated um, by its bylaws to engage in those kinds of games. Some of these ones that were withdrawn or failed, I, we kept the letters in there just so you didn't think they were accidentally missed as an error. Proposal AA, uh, limit alternate allocations. Our, by our bylaws right now, that says your alternate allocation for your state is the larger of 50 or the number of primary dele delegates that you get, which means that a state like Wyoming, which gets four delegates, gets 50 alternates. That makes no sense. Again, the purpose of alternates is so that you have an heir and a spare, so that you have a spare for each delegate. So in this proposal, if your state gets such as Colorado, I think we have 31 delegates, we'd get 31 alternates, not 50. But the larger states, which already would, so California has 103 delegates, it would still get its 103 alternates. The number of alternates would be equal to the number of delegates that you get. That makes logical sense. Um, proposal BB put a time limit on LNC appeals. Uh, there are rights of appeal of LNC decisions if you believe the LNC has broken the bylaws, but it's like open-ended. Like, can you uh, appeal an LNC decision from 
10 years ago. I mean, in theory, you can under this. These things need to be done timely so that we have stability in the organization. So that's what this is about. Uh, clean up status language. Uh, we don't know if this is going to make it to the final report, but it, it it's fun. This was Mr. Latham. Um, and call it, instead of calling them, that should say affiliate chair. That's a typo, not affiliation chair. I will fix that. Let me make a note of that. That's in proposal CC. Um, so instead of calling them state chairs, because, you know, our opinion of, of the state, um, we're calling them affiliates. Plus, that also makes it a bit more consistent because we do allow um, territories to be affiliates. We haven't had one in a while. But in the past, Puerto Rico was an affiliate. And they're not a state. They're an affiliate. So anyway. Uh, resolve affiliate disputes. We talked about that. HH, limit minority reports. There was a concern of, I think it was 2018, we had, was it platform, a couple proposals that had multiple minority reports. And the reason why that's so easy to do is because people could join in more than one minority report. It was 2018. This, yeah, this would say that if you're gonna join in a minority report, you have to pick one. And there still could be some edge cases in which there are two minority reports, but this would make it a lot less likely. Um, KK uh, just says that the LNC doesn't have to take a vote on resignations. It's really, really cumbersome. It can be forgotten. Um, and you can have a, a situation um, where a resignation wasn't formally accepted. It's still in a short period of time. And you have a vote where, say it's a vote that requires two thirds of the entire LNC. Um, that person is still counted as an LNC member until the resignation is voted upon and accepted, unless there's been you know, a certain passage of time, but they've already told you, I quit. I'm not coming back here to vote on anything. So they're an effective no when they're really an effective no longer an LNC member. So this makes it so that resignations shall be effective effective once tendered some people have said could this cause a problem with like the issue of treasurer we do are required by the fec to have an assistant treasurer to step in so it would not um that was the the one concern that was raised there under clarified quorum issues there's been a, an ongoing dispute as to whether our bylaws allow checkout I don't believe they do. Ms. Matson shares my point of view. Mr. Brown does not. I think Mr. Jacob shares my point of view. This needs to be clarified one way or another. The way the committee decided to clarify it was to take the Roberts definition that whether or not you leave, your, your name is still counted in the quorum requirement. Um, Removal from office, uh, this codifies the controversy um, that resulted in the voiding of my alleged suspension last term in which it was says I was denied due process. This codifies to the LNC that they have to provide due process when you're going to remove somebody that was put in by the delegates. So if you're going to override the will of the delegates, the procedure needs to be difficult. Um, so this codifies kind of what the decision was in the voiding of my suspension. And it puts it in one article. Our bylaws are kind of a one day article six and seven need to be combined. Mr. Starr did try to do that one year and his proposal was good, but it didn't pass. Um, there should just be one article called National Committee that has officers and everything in it. That will be a lot easier to do if we get rid of regionals because it will be a lot cleaner. But right now, so you have Article 6, which has a removal clause, and Article 7, which has a removal clause. And they're identical, except for saying one is officers and one is 
members at large. This would strike both of those and just put them in one article called removal from office that covers all the cases and gives the procedure in which proper due process um, would be afforded. Proposal PP, there might be a minority report on this. The, the original proposal was to require delegates to be members, um, sustaining members of the National Party. Uh, there was some objection to that. There was some question as to FEC issues with that, which I have since cleared up with the treasurer. But it seemed like everybody was okay with passing um, a proposal to say, in this dual path to be qualified as a delegate, that you can't just be a national party member, you either need to be a sustaining national party member or a member of an affiliate. There might be a minority report to make it that you have to be a sustaining member of the national party. It's unclear whether people want to sign off on that. This is the, this is the majority report. This is the report of the committee to, to say, on the, if you're going to go the, the national membership route, you need to be a sustaining member, not merely just a pledge signer. For candidate nominations, this is actually an important one. Um, this has been a subject of dispute for a long time. It's obvious that the intent of this bylaw was that affiliate parties can't endorse Republicans or Democrats for partisan office. However, the language, who is a member of another party, is fantastically vague because other parties don't have membership in the same way we do, though some of them do, and we're not privy to their membership roles. Obviously, what was meant here is... If, if they're running as a Republican, we're not endorsing them. But this also caused an issue in states in which state law allows fusion nominations. So fusion states have always kind of had the sort of Damocles over their head. Technically, they were violating the bylaws and having fusion candidates. Um, and there's no reason to do that in states that allow fusion. I hate fusion, but that's not my decision. Um, we can't have this weird, maybe, maybe not threat over the heads of fusion states. So this codifies the intent. So what it says is no affiliate party shall, what it would say if passed. And I do see your hand, Mr. Seebeck, once I'm done reading it, I'll call upon you. Um, and we are getting towards the end, but I don't mind saying a bit later. Uh, no affiliate party shall endorse any candidate for public office in any partisan election unless the candidate A is not listed under any other partisan ballot line, unless the candidate is also listed under the affiliate party's ballot line. So that deals with fusion and B is registered to vote under the partisan designation of the affiliate party if available. So even in fusion um, states, it, they need to be libertarians, but they can be under other partisan ballot lines if it is a fusion state. This captures the spirit, the obvious spirit of the prior language while removing this kind of weird threat from fusion states. Mr. Seebeck and then Mr. Conrad. No, that's okay. I was just gonna mention we're close to time, so. Yeah, Mr. Conrad. I was just going to mention. You cut out, Mr. Conrad? Well, are you, can you hear me? Uh, now I can. Very good. I was just going to mention that under the markup legend, it says that deletions shall precede additions, but that seems to have been reversed in this proposal. Thank you. I will fix that. I love having a million proofreaders because it's so easy. So this was... Proposal QQ. I'm sure that's happened in a couple other places too. Don't worry, we'll get it in the final. Yeah, in the final we'll get it, but this really helps um, having so many eyeballs on it. Well, this isn't like an official meeting. Um, bylaws committee members weren't required to come. We are at time, 
But if people wanted to stick around for a, a little bit longer, I can only stay a little bit longer because I am still have to pack for Arizona for tomorrow. Um, but if we wanted to just quickly go through some of the others, we can do that. Mr. Seebeck. How many are left after this? Um, our, I think one, let's see, I'm not sure. Let's see that we already talked about this one, the regionals. Uh, so that was it. No. So we're actually done. <laughs> All right. If there's any final comments, Mr. Conrad. Um, on the proposal to have states continually update the LNC on their uh, updates to their, their state bylaws. Yes. Was there a timeline on that? We, we went through that one kind of fast. Um, no, because there's also no penalty like associated with it. It's just, you know how when you update your bylaws, you're supposed to send it to your secretary of state. Like you just send it to the national party at the same time. And honestly, um, I normally periodically check all the state party websites and download them myself, but sometimes they don't have it up on there. And um, if I write the state chair for it, it's nice to say, you know, here's the bylaw that says you're supposed to send it to us, but there's no penalty attached to it. So no, there's no time frame. It would be considered within a reasonable time frame. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Seebeck? Uh, just a general announcement, or is that more weight on that? <laughs> oh, no, go ahead, because uh, once nobody else wants to talk, I'm going to get packing. Okay, um, real quick, I know that Karen Ann's visit got a ton of uh, conventions on her plate for serving as parliamentarian. Uh, recently, I, I did pass my entrance exam in, in, into the NAP, so I'm also available for states if they need somebody. So, <laughs> In case anybody needs somebody, let, let me know. Hey, thank you. All right. I don't see any other hands. I do appreciate so many people um, coming out to this. We will, I will be putting up this video as soon as I can. It'll probably be after this weekend though, because I do need to edit out the chit chat in the beginning and do it from when we when we officially started the meeting. And just for everyone's um, reference, I don't know whether we will be able to do this, but the plan is as we get closer to convention and the bylaws committee has narrowed down its proposals at least somewhat and smoothed out any wording issues that we want to have something that's somewhat like a mock convention uh, where we like, pretend to vote on these things and see how it shakes out and see it and, and do debate and everything so that we we have an idea what people's thoughts are so be on the lookout for that mr rola anticipating that uh it's quite likely that at the next meeting we'll be totally done with proposals will the next thing be to uh to take proposals that have to do with each other or that depend on each other and kind of tweak those or will the next step be to uh put them in roughly the order we want to present them i think we'll discuss that next next bylaws committee meeting i think it's going to be up to the committee i certainly have some thoughts on it but this is probably something that's going to require some decisions of the committee as to how we want to proceed i figured we'd talk about that next meeting okay everyone um I will see you next Thursday, and I thank everyone for coming out. I hope you have an awesome evening. Good night. Good night, everyone.